I went into the data skeptic offices today for the first time in, oh, a couple of months, I guess. I may start working there now myself. I don't know when I want to have the team back, because even though here in Los Angeles the shelter-in-place order has been lifted, I'm not so sure if that was a good idea, and at least for the time being, the data skeptic team remains remote. Linda and Yoshi and I pretty much remain sheltered in place for the most part. Although I did stop in at my favorite breakfast place on Central Avenue there in south of downtown L.A. and ordered my breakfast sandwich at the top of my lungs so it could get through not only my mask, but the plexiglass that now separated me from the lady at the counter. So for a moment, let's all think back a few months or go back to a time when you might have gone into a restaurant. And in that restaurant, you sat down at a table and maybe even ordered a glass of wine or a cocktail or just a soft drink or whatever, finished your beverage, paid your bill, got up and left. Now imagine, if unbeknownst to you, the proprietor of that restaurant had everybody retrieve the glasses, the wine glasses or the drink glasses or whatever, and the staff would put those on a tray so they wouldn't touch them too much, take them into the back, and there they were fingerprinted. And everyone who ate at that restaurant had their fingerprints collected, correlated with the bill, and the owner said, you know, it's not that big of a deal. He actually intends to open source that data set so that maybe, you know, some student could do a correlation analysis between how many ridges are on your fingertips and how well you tip or some sort of thing like that. Just data science. Can you imagine the outrage people would have if they found out that such a restaurateur was collecting their fingerprints as they left them behind so carelessly in that restaurant? You put them there, you brought them in, you left them. You could have wiped your glass down, but you didn't. You got up and left. Somehow, though, that's offensive. Yet the whole while, there was a camera there, and you put your face on it. You could have covered your face or averted your face, not gone in there. But if it comes out that a restaurateur has a security system with cameras... No one's offended. One biometric is okay to track, but the other is not. Why is that? Today on the show, I speak with Deborah Raji about her recent paper, Saving Face, investigating the ethical concerns of facial recognition auditing. We cover a lot of ground on the topic of facial recognition, current implementations, and several problems, as well as this audit Deborah was involved in that explored the performance and the change in performance post-audit of a lot of the facial recognition commercial cloud services that are out there. Hi, I'm Deb Raji, and I'm a tech fellow at the AI Now Institute at New York University. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. To kick off, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Yeah, I started off studying robotics engineering at the University of Toronto in Canada. And then I spent a year working on the applied machine learning team at Clarify, which is a computer vision company in New York. And then while at Clarify, I sort of noticed that there was in the computer vision community, especially with facial recognition and in that space in particular, there was glaring racial disparities in terms of our data sets. So the data sets being used in the facial recognition space in particular was very visible that there were huge demographic disparities, huge underrepresentation of people of color, for example, and certain demographic skews. And this was in my intuitive observation at the time. It's since been empirically demonstrated, but at the time it was just an intuition. So I started digging into it and like exploring it more. And that led me to work with Joy Buemwini at the MIT Media Lab. And she was working on a project called Gender Shades. So the Gender Shades project was really an investigation into the performance of mainstream deployed machine learning systems by IBM, Face++, and Microsoft. And she looked specifically at facial recognition systems for the task of gender classification. And she said, what would happen if we evaluated models, these deployed models already out there in the wild, already being sold, already being used by developers, you know, what would happen if we evaluated these systems on not the demographically skewed benchmarks that we all use in the computer vision community, but what if we created a new benchmark that was not demographically skewed, that was balanced for gender representation and also skin type. So that's what she did. She created this benchmark and 
evaluated these mainstream computer vision, facial recognition APIs on that demographically balanced benchmark. And what she found out was that there was a huge disparity between the performance on darker skinned females and lighter skinned males. And it was an important revelation, especially the facial recognition community, to realize that a lot of the data sets that they were using were not demographically representative. And there was a lot of racial bias, but also general demographic bias in the models that they were building and deploying. So I worked with her that summer and we did a lot of follow-up work to gender shades, analyzing and beginning to try to understand what companies did in response to gender shades, how they diversified their data sets in order to do better on the benchmark that we had created, how certain companies responded or did not respond in response to being targeted for a specific audit. And then we also kind of looked at particular elements of the audit design that led to impact, that led to the companies feeling pushed to change their behavior. And at the same time, I was also, I guess, a fellow, a research mentee at Google, and I was working with colleagues there to think about documentation. How do we communicate the performance of a machine learning system? And how can we incorporate some of these ideas around auditing into the way that we present and talk about and document the performance of machine learning system. And that sort of launched me on this whole journey, <laughs> which is where I am now, it's like thinking about evaluation of machine learning systems, especially under the language of auditing and assessment, thinking about demographic bias, but assessment in other ways and other elements of the system. And then also thinking about the communication of the performance of the system. How do we document any of these things in a way that gives us a sense of how the model performs when in the real world? And that's really connected to what this paper is about as well. This paper was written with some of the colleagues at Google that I had been working with on that documentation project, but also other colleagues from the computer vision space asking, what do we learn and what can we not learn from what we call the gender shade style audit? What do we learn from these audits on demographic bias and what is still missing information that we still need to figure out a way to capture and document in order to really communicate and understand the full performance of a model or a system or an AI system once it's deployed. So yeah, that's sort of a brief overview of the whole journey of how we got here. And this paper in particular is in response to the fact that following the Gender Shades project and following the subsequent sort of follow-up work to Gender Shades, we were realizing that a lot of people were just taking the benchmark from Gender Shades or recreating a shadow version of that benchmark and using that as a moratorium condition in policy, for example, or trying to use a similar method to assess the suitability of a model before deploying a facial recognition model for demographic disparities. And what we found, this paper goes into detail as to ethics. There's a right way to do that and there's a wrong way to do that. And there's sort of important, more nuanced ethical questions involved that need to be considered, that need to be talked about when assessing a facial recognition system, for example, but any broad AI system. And we need to sort of ask ourselves these more careful, nuanced questions, be aware of some of these more nuanced ethical tensions before we allow these systems to be deployed. Yeah, it's concerning to learn that a deployed model, not just some little research experiment, but something out there being sold had these properties. And when I look through it, it's hard for me to find a villain, I guess, except to say that the system's wrong. Where do we need to make an improvement to see that things like this don't tend to happen in the future? Yeah, it's funny. You're like, there's no villain. But there, another interpretation is like, there's multiple villains. Not necessarily villains. There's multiple points of intervention and there's multiple ways that we can begin to understand and assess this. I think a lot of the mistakes that we see and a lot of the failures that we see are really the result of a lack of consciousness around some of these issues. I think for a long time in computer vision, especially, but also in AI and ML more broadly, when I was working on the applied machine learning team and I was doing some machine learning engineering work, a lot of the decisions that were being made were just chalked up to this is part of your job. This is how it's done. And there was not necessarily as nuanced a critique coming in from the outside. So because of that, you know, assessing the performance of a model on a demographically balanced test set, for example, was not necessarily something that was an understood practice. It wasn't necessarily the norm. So a lot of people just didn't engage just because there was a lack of consciousness around that practice. However, it's not necessarily just the engineers within these companies or the culture of these companies that omits that. In research for a very long time, people were not aware of the realities of the fact that you need a demographically representative test set. You need to be talking about racial and, and gender and also other types of, of bias in the test set in order to really understand the conditions of deployment. And then similar to what our paper argues, we talk about how, you know, 
there's some of these ethical trade-offs that need to be considered. There's a right way to collect data and a wrong way to collect data. There's certain taxonomies. So the labels that we impose as the objectives of these systems, for example, using a facial recognition system to predict gender in the first place, defining it, all the systems we evaluated defined it as binary gender. And that omitted a whole category of people. So the setup of that taxonomy excludes a certain population of people by definition of the objectives of the system itself. So there's so many ways, there's so many decisions that we make as machine learning engineers, data scientists, AI researchers that we're not necessarily aware of, or it's not necessarily articulated to us as decision making, but it is decisions that are being made. And what we argue here is that all of this needs to be recorded, all of this needs to be communicated in order for us to get a better sense of what that journey actually looks like. And it's not necessarily just researchers and practitioners like practical engineers. There's also, and we mentioned this in the paper, and this is usually how our paper is being used, it's sort of cited in work critiquing the setup of standards in policy. So a lot of policy measures against facial recognition, for example, when critiquing the functionality of facial recognition to make the argument that we will only use facial recognition when it works, they'll try to set up a condition that's centered on demographic performance. So to say, you know, if it works well for these different subgroups, and there's like this minimum difference between the subgroups, then we can say that the system works, quote unquote. And that was a trend that we were seeing in a couple of the policy proposals for facial recognition. And one of the reasons why we wrote this paper was to say like, hey, actually NIST standards or the National Institute of Standards and Technology and even IEEE standards and other standards governing bodies establishing these rules to define what it means for a facial recognition system to work should think beyond just accuracy and should think beyond just equal performance across different demographic subgroups. They should start thinking about all these other considerations. They should think about, you know, the taxonomies. They should think about the privacy violations that happen along the way. And they should understand the way that these topics intersect and actually lead to some tensions that we see where sometimes improving representation of the data set will lead to greater privacy violations. And they need to understand these things when designing the standards that evaluate these models within the policy landscape. So yeah, that's policymakers, engineers, researchers, really everyone is kind of needing to think about some of these things. Some of the more classic metrics, you know, you mentioned accuracy and we could get into F1 scores and stuff like that. These have had the success they've had and I think are as common as they are because they're easy to calculate. Our software libraries kind of do that for us in a lot of cases. It's pretty universal in the published literature, but I guess we could say it's necessary but not sufficient to your points about uh, there are other metrics. Will they be as formal as that? Can we develop formulas or are these more qualitative measures? Yeah, a lot of these are qualitative. And that was one of the main recommendations from the paper was to think about some of these qualitative measures and communicate them, mostly because, you know, the computer vision community is very comfortable with the idea of getting, you know, an accuracy score and then comparing that across different subgroups. That's something that is sort of fits within the paradigm of how we evaluate and assess things. But for something like privacy, like how do you quantitatively measure that? How do you assess that? Even something like understanding that trade-off, how do we communicate that to ourselves in a way that makes sense? So there's a section of the paper where we talk about assessing performance across different demographic groups is really great, but there's sort of a more nuanced argument around intersectionality. You have like different demographic groups, but you also have intersections of these demographic groups. And how do you account for that? And how do you think about that and reflect on that? And there's computational methods to show that you're thinking about some of these ideas. So there's ways to calculate a representation of some of these ideals and to represent that in the documentation. A lot of the considerations that we bring up are more holistic considerations. They're things that we hope that people write down and reflect on and not necessarily calculate. And I think that like these considerations are in a slightly separate category from calculations. That being said, though, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a really important governing body for facial recognition technology in the US, they have some of these qualitative assessments already in place, but for things like the usability of the tool, for example, they'll have some of these like qualitative like check marks and like open ended questions that they'll ask vendors, but it'll be around like how easy is it to use the tool? How does it integrate into whatever application? So we're just saying like, hey, it's not necessarily too far off from some of the questions you're already asking, but just include ethical considerations as one of the like additional qualitative assessments or considerations to write down and communicate as part of the like assessment process of a facial recognition system. And tell me a little bit about CelebSet. 
Yeah, so Celeb Set was our attempt at making our point effectively. So we knew that the points that we were making would be very hard to grasp if not anchored to a very solid example. So Celeb Set is our version of saying like, hey, Gender Shades is this project that worked because there was a demographically balanced test set that had an equal set of examples for different skin types. And then also an equal set of examples for binary gender classification. And because of that, you know, you had this intersectional test set and you could evaluate and assess that uh, the model. So Lev said was us being like, we want to make the point that gender shade style audit is not enough. So we're going to walk you through a gender shade style audit and talk about this. So Celeb set was really our version of that test set. So it was created to make a point. <laughs> so we had created this test set that was balanced for binary gender, so male, female, and skin type, so a darker skin type versus lighter skin type, similar to gender shades, except now we actually had metadata around not just gender classification, but also age classification, the celebrity name, uh, smile detection, and then also just like face detection. We had like the bounding boxes for each of these faces. And what that let us do was that when we did our audit on Celeb Set, we actually were able to see the performance of Microsoft, Amazon, and Clarify, who are the companies that we audited. We were able to see their performance across different demographics for all of these different tasks. And it was really great <laughs> because we were able to make a lot of the points that we wanted to make using CelebSet. So for example, one of the points that we were able to make using CelebSet was the fact that after being audited, one of the lessons from our past studies is after a company gets audited once, they re-release their product and they do better on the benchmark and on which they're audited. And that was really a lot of the findings of the last two studies was on the gender shades test set. Once they're audited once, then they re-release their API and they do a better job the second time. What we found out with a celeb set was that not only do they do a better job, they do a better job on the specific task <laughs> that they're audited on. Microsoft, for example, was audited on the gender task twice. So they did really, really well on the gender task. There was very little disparity between the darker female subgroup and the lighter male subgroup. But on the age task, there's like a 30% disparity between the darker female subgroup and the lighter male subgroup. So you can see that the companies are sort of not necessarily diversifying their data along all these different dimensions. They were sort of improving themselves to the test set. And this is a really compelling case for something like facial recognition, where people developing standards for this technology need to understand that whatever standards that they create will effectively be the new goalpost. And they have to be very intentional about the tasks that they're evaluating and how they're evaluating these tasks and what their data sets actually represent. Another thing about Celebs that we're able to talk about age distribution and how just because something is balanced for gender and skin type doesn't mean that it's balanced with respect to age and that there's like potential bias with respect to age representation and how do you accommodate that. And then we also had a section here where with CelebSet, because we had the celebrity names and we could actually like have a conversation around taxonomy and like the selection of different objectives for the system, we were able to talk about like, oh, you know, why is it that the age is classified along these axes? Why is it that we're looking at gender in a binary way? We were just able to have a lot of conversations around the design of this benchmark and the design of the audit process by using the example of CelebSet. So that was how that came in. But it's a great benchmark to critically evaluate the process of auditing for facial recognition. And when you saw the systems make errors, those three different vendors, were they kind of making similar errors or did everyone have their own flavor of error making? <laughs> I think most people had their own flavors, but they had their own flavors, but it was in a predictable way. So for example, so we purposefully selected Microsoft, Amazon, and Clarify for a reason. One is that, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, and Clarify have facial recognition APIs that will predict gender, age, name, smile detection, and also like face detection. So it covered the full range of tasks that we had labels for, which was nice. And then the other thing about Microsoft, Amazon, and Clarify is Microsoft was audited in gender shades. Amazon was audited in a follow-up study called Actionable Auditing, and Clarify had never been audited before. So it was kind of a good way to talk about the influence of an audit on the performance of these systems. And we saw, you know, in our results, Microsoft and Amazon, who were both audited for the gender classification task, had very little disparity between the best performing subgroup and the least performing subgroup, which was darker female. So that's Amazon and Microsoft. 
But Clarify, which had never been audited before, still had a huge disparity between lighter males and darker females. And then, you know, all of Microsoft, Amazon, and Clarify on the tasks that they were not audited on. So age classification, name classification, smile or no smile classification, that binary smile detection model. We can see that, you know, they still have disparities between the best performant and the, the least performant group. So yeah, in that case, you know, they all had their own flavor, but it was really specific to their context and how the company had been audited in the past, which speaks a lot to the impact of an audit. And that's one of the first considerations we talk about. We talk about the fact that, you know, when you design an audit, you're actually really providing a target for these systems, for these companies to be thinking about. So you actually have to be very careful about the task demographic that you design the audit for and the categories, the way that you arrange the data of the audit, because it really does influence the way that these companies respond. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, one of the strengths pointed out in the paper to me that the very act of the audit is an impetus for improvement. So it seems like a success all around. With that in mind, do you have any thoughts on what should happen next? Should we have some industry standard opt-in? Should we have a governmental policy requiring these sorts of things? Where do we go with audits? Yeah, I keep mentioning NIST just because there's an influential auditing body in the facial recognition space. They assess a lot of the facial recognition tools that are considered for procurement by the government in the US. So usually they assess facial recognition tools in two parts. So the first part is this idea of face verification where they see two faces and they want to verify that it's the same face or a different face. They usually have a part two, which is this idea of face identification. If I have a face and I have a database of faces, can I figure out if my face is in this database? And this year they added a part three. It was great to see them citing our paper actually, where they talk about the idea of assessing the performance of the model for different demographics. So this is the first year where they've actually acknowledged the fact that there needs to be this demographic breakdown of performance in order to understand how the model performs for different groups. And this is actually like a conversation that happened in sort of mainstream scientific inquiry, especially biomedicine, where people were realizing that assessing pharmaceutical drug candidate, for example, on a broad population required a breakdown of the performance of the drug on different subgroups. So I feel like computer vision, especially facial recognition, is kind of going through that moment of like, oh, wait, actually, we need to figure out how well this works on these different subgroups for us to say that it worked at all. <laughs> so I think that was sort of the response from NIST at the time. And what we're pushing for is a lot of things. So I think that is a really interesting and cool first step. I'm glad that they've done that. And I'm hoping to see other auditing bodies and standards bodies follow their lead and say like, hey, it's actually important to think about demographics. But one of the points of this paper is also that beyond functionality, there's a lot of threats embedded in a system like facial recognition. So for example, there's a lot of privacy concerns. Facial recognition is kind of a face is the equivalent of a fingerprint with respect to its identity as this identifiable biometric. So because of that, you have to be really careful about these huge data sets of faces that are required to build these systems. It's so easily weaponized by whichever authority is in charge of that. So it's this easily weaponized tool. It requires an immense amount of privacy violation in order to collect that data and to predict on someone with that data. So there's other issues to facial recognition beyond accuracy, but I find that accuracy is a good critique to kind of get the ball rolling on these conversations, these more nuanced conversations around the weaponization of the tool and the privacy violations with the tool. So for me, I see this paper is kind of making the point of like, actually, there's a right way to do the audits. They're properly asking questions about the right demographics. They're properly sort of targeting the right questions and they're done in a way that's ethical. And then there's the second point that we allude to, which is that actually there's other questions that you should be asking. So if you're NIST, how much do you actually know about the privacy measures that were taken by any of the vendors that you're assessing? How much do you actually ask about or some of these other tensions around the taxonomies that are being used for other classifications or other services that the API provides? So I think we're attempting at minimum to get these assessments and these standards to take on a more holistic qualitative element to like include that as part of their assessment and understanding of how these tools work. And I guess like the long term goal here is to just like begin a more nuanced conversation around the functionality of these systems so that we can get to a point where we can talk about restriction and we can understand the risk better than we do today. Because today, I think we're a little bit naive about all the ethical concerns of facial recognition. It's not fully captured or documented all the ways that things could go wrong. So hopefully with this paper, we can kind of start having these more nuanced conversations about some of these other elements that we need to think about 
and how we need to talk about them. Hopefully through this example, it's clear how we can begin to communicate about these risks as part of the assessment process, as part of the standards process or the evaluation process of these systems. So that's sort of where we were going with this paper and hopefully how we wanted to influence the discourse or continue to influence the discourse of auditing bodies like NIST and the decisions that they make. Thanks to this week's sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. I love The Great Courses Plus, and I think you will too. It really keeps me learning about the world. It's easy to use, and they've got a huge library that's ever-growing. Lots of cool content. I just noticed today they've added adult education in the age of AI. I'm going to have to check that out. That's not vetted yet. That's not my official recommendation. It's probably good. I'll have to watch it first. But for this week, I want to recommend Mastering Linear Algebra, an introduction with applications. Now, why this one when there's so many things to discover on The Great Courses Plus? It's because I know, quite frankly, the majority of you do not have your linear algebra down. Most of you get by without it. Some of you say, ah, these are just two-dimensional arrays, whatever. You should know about the dagger and the Hadamard transformation and the Hamiltonian and all this kind of stuff. It's important, guys. It's the language of machine learning. That's how all the algorithms tend to be expressed. You can do them algorithmically, too, but you're going to need linear algebra at one point or another. Maybe you had the course maybe you didn't. Either way, you need this to get your fluency up. These great video courses take you through the content. Easy to follow. Kick back and watch these. It'll be a pleasure. You can stream it to all your internet connected devices. You can take it with you on the go, but it's seamless across all your platforms. So if you're sharing devices, no big deal. I love the great courses plus, and I know you're going to also. You can start a free trial by using this URL. It's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash data. Head over there and see the wide array of options available. TheGreatCoursesPlus.com slash data. So I have a friend who uh, is building a mobile app. And when you load it up, one of the first things you do is you take a profile picture and then you fill out some demographic details. And he was really happy because he actually started using one of these APIs to do some analysis of those profile photos. And then he's going to use those to predict gender, predict age, and pre-fill out the other profile points, which hopefully he gets them right. If he doesn't, maybe hurt somebody's feelings, but they can fix it and on we go. Not really a weapon. Tell a scarier story. <laughs> <laughs> One of our points here, we double down on this all the time, is this idea of communication and the role of being clear about the assessment of the tool, right? So I hope your friend, as part of the process of testing his app, used a benchmark that represented to some degree the population that he wants to use his tool on, that he collected the data for that benchmark in a way that's respectful and you know doesn't violate privacy, that he's able to communicate the limitations of the taxonomies from the APIs that he's using. And that he's able to like sort of write all of this down and provide documentation to help others using his app to be able to access that information around the specifics of how the system works and the specifics of where that system is expected to fail. For example, you know, build this app and you maybe you're deploying the technology in a particular demographic environment and you evaluate it on that demographic environment and it doesn't work very well at all. That's something that at minimum you need to communicate to users of that app. And that's sort of our point here is that that like there's all of these qualitative and quantitative considerations that need to be communicated there's all of these tensions that happen that need to just be discussed and exposed in order for you to ethically release that app. And then the other point here too is like being very careful around that claim of facial recognition works, right? So being very attentive of the fact that, oh, you know, there needs to be potentially other methods of, if it was, for example, the entry system into an application, or if it was providing a function that was within the broader sort of system that might affect somebody, thinking about alternatives and saying like, okay, you know, know, facial recognition is available, but like, what are these other alternatives? If someone wanted to opt out, can we provide that option for them? So this is sort of the kind of questions that should hopefully come out of them understanding better what it means to audit or evaluate these systems. I've seen some recent headlines about the various providers. Uh, IBM seems to be making the biggest of the headlines of rolling back what they're going to sell in terms of facial recognition. Whether you think this is a, a good step, a small step, uh, just your thoughts on the whole situation. That was pretty wild. That happened last week. Yeah, so IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon, surprisingly Amazon, all sort of made a commitment to press pause on facial recognition. And I think it's an important and interesting stance that should be celebrated to some degree, which is this idea of, and all of them sort of communicated this in their press releases and in their public discussions on this topic, where they say, we don't feel comfortable selling 
facial recognition to the police, understanding how that tool can be easily weaponized by the police, especially in this moment of heavy racial tension in the states, but also this moment of distrust in the police and the role of the police in terms of these protests. And I think, you know, that's the work of a lot of activists and a lot of advocates over several years to connect the conversation of facial recognition to racial disparity, but also to the conversation of surveillance and how facial recognition is the surveillance tool disproportionately used on minorities, but does not work for minorities. So I think that whole narrative is really created by advocates to like get them to that point of understanding. I think the the main win is sort of this idea of a moratorium. So to say that this more nuanced conversation, so, you know, a lot of the topics covered in this paper around transparency, around how to audit in a way that is appropriate, around some of these dynamics of privacy versus representation, that's a more nuanced conversation. And while that more nuanced conversation is going on, the way I interpret these announcements is sort of to say like, oh, while these conversations are going on and we're working towards a place of setting important restrictions to the use of this technology that we recognize is very easily weaponized, we're going to stop selling facial recognition. Before they had made these announcements, they were still selling facial recognition while these nuanced conversations were going on and people were trying to arrive at a place of defining legislation and defining policy for facial recognition. So you can kind of like see the hypocrisy of that. I'm glad that they got to a point where they were like, oh, you know, while we're having conversations about facial recognition being harmful and trying to negotiate the details of the, the policy on facial recognition, we probably shouldn't be selling it at the same time. It probably shouldn't already be deployed, you know, while that's happening. So that was like a really big realization for them to be like, oh, wait, actually, we shouldn't be selling this thing while this very serious conversation is happening. And this very nuanced conversation is happening about all the risks and all the concerns involved in the sale of facial recognition. So I think in that case, it's a win. But ultimately, you know, there was a great article I read in Bloomberg by Cassie O'Neill, where she was talking about the Real ID Act and how there's certain policies that make it really hard to ban facial recognition. It makes it really hard to completely remove it from American life. So it's really a lot of the power with respect to truly eliminating facial recognition from American life requires an act of Congress. Like it requires bills to be passed. It requires legislation. Even to go as far as to say restricting the use of facial recognition in particularly harmful scenarios, that will require policymakers to step up and to play that role. But I do think the fact that IBM Amazon and Microsoft's stance was so public was an important move just because I think public opinion is, has seen a lot of evidence that facial recognition does not necessarily work as well as we think it does. Um, it has all of these limitations that we need to be aware of, and it could be a potentially dangerous and misused technology that we need to be careful about. So I think that message to the public and to policymakers and hopefully to the politicians that represent the public can put us in a more favorable position when it comes to advocating for policy that can restrict the use of facial recognition. You know, I'm not really a security professional, but I at least know enough to know that two-factor authentication is really good. Three-factor would be even better, or four-factor, whatever. Maybe, you know, as one of the components in security at a highly secure place, facial recognition should be a piece of that. And that doesn't seem like anything we'd want to get rid of. Certainly, I guess people building those systems would want to be smart about their data sets, as you're pointing out, and have a balanced data set. Is that enough? Can they ensure that they have a good data set and just trust the algorithms from there forward? Or is there more to it? Yeah, so that was one of the things that we talk about in our paper is that if you have a balanced data set, if you identify every axis of consideration that you see as important and relevant, and then you sort of build a benchmark that looks at these traits and looks at each of the intersections of these traits, and you perform well on all of these intersections for all of the tasks that are relevant, is this enough? I think our answer is no. <laughs> you still need to communicate certain things, right? So I've had interesting conversations with people talking about the California ban, for example. So there was a couple of Californian cities that banned facial recognition, San Francisco being one of them. And they actually had to create exceptions for the iPhone and also just like biometric entry into specific government systems, things like that. It's a situation in which it's a very controlled environment. There's consent. So there's the question of like, oh, what's the big deal? That's fine. I think the issue here or 
the issue with even those situations is one, the lack of actual communication around the specifics of those systems. So even in the case of the iPhone, there's a lot of reported cases of Asian Americans struggling with being identified through the iPhone and that being attributed to the lack of representation and the benchmarks that the iPhone's facial recognition system is being evaluated on and trained on. Um, so even the iPhone has its racial biases, which can end up locking someone out. There's a case of a building in New York. The landlord installed a facial recognition system as the entry point into the building. But for the Asian residents of the building, they have struggled to be identified appropriately through the facial recognition system because it's just not built for them. So in those cases, there's still a lot of risk involved by the system not being demographically balanced or not being evaluated on a test set that's demographically balanced. The idea of auditing and assessing for these things is still really important. But even outside of that, one of the main challenges of facial recognition is the fact that it requires the collection of a lot of data of faces. And it's kind of like the same fear that you can have if someone had like a data set of tens of millions of fingerprints or like DNA samples, you know, something that feels like, oh, this is like really specific to individuals. It's a biometric. It's something that can be used to identify me in the same way a fingerprint can, in the same way my DNA can. And having one authority figure to just like govern this huge data set of identifiable biometric data is an alarming act of itself. So Illinois has a great piece of policy called BIPA, where they're very aware of the fact that no one should be allowed to collect large amounts of biometric data about other people because that gives them almost too much power. It's so easy to manipulate that data set and that situation against whichever population they happen to have the data of. The risk involved, it's like even if it's seemingly benign situation of, oh, just give us your face so that we can put you into the system so that we can identify you to give you access to something, for example, I still have your face. And if I wanted to, I, I can even easily take that system and use it against you. I can use it to monitor you if I wanted. I can use it to harass you if I wanted. As we've seen in the case of the landlord, there's another case of a landlord in a building in New York who wanted to install a facial recognition system in order to like monitor his tenants. The way he was going to collect that data was to set up the facial recognition entry system. But by collecting everyone's face, now he's able to scan through the CCTV data and figure out where his tenants are and like use that to harass them. Or he could even use that to build an eviction case if he wanted. So, you know, there's a lot of considerations around how the collection of that much biometric data causes this power imbalance that's inherently uncomfortable. So I think that's something about facial recognition that like makes it inherently sort of this like toxic, very difficult technology to deal with in the first place. If there's an alternative, use it. (laughs) Yeah, a more secure building sounds great, but at the risk of having a stalker landlord, it's a strange trade-off. Yeah. With that in mind, I mean, do you have any thoughts on what deployments, like some of these things will be solved in the horizon, right? We'll get better balanced data sets. We'll have auditing procedures. This is a solvable problem if we put the best minds on it. I don't want to over-trivialize the effort. At the day when the algorithms, the models work pretty good and they're open source and all that kind of stuff, there's still these like limits of you thought so long if you could, you didn't ask if you should. Do you have any thoughts on what's reasonable for what are good applications of facial recognition technology, if any? Yeah, there's entire marketing teams at Amazon, at Microsoft, (laughs) thinking about this. Not to trivialize your question, but just to say that I always read about the positive use cases of facial recognition or the proposed positive use cases of facial recognition. The way that it's sort of advertised, especially facial recognition systems that do this classification task that we're assessing with this paper, facial recognition systems that do that. We talk about, I think there's a section of this paper too that mentions some of these kitted use cases of like, oh, you know, we need to understand the demographics of an audience for our particular tool or a particular website. We need to understand the demographics of a particular crowd without interacting with the crowd. We need to find missing people. We need to find missing children specifically is brought up a lot for human trafficking. And then there's sort of like medical therapeutic cases of, oh, we need facial recognition, track of people's moods, to track them through the house, surveil them for the sake of their own safety and benefit. And it sounds inherently better than bad cases that we see. So use in criminal justice system, for example, is like something that feels like, oh, that's kind of icky. Or even the use of facial recognition as part of like hiring processes. So A lot of people try to use facial recognition to identify if someone is calm or if someone is excited enough during a video job interview. And like that kind of use of facial recognition is inherently kind of icky. But I feel like even these positive use cases, I would really implore those people 
working on those positive use cases to think about alternatives. My perception is that facial recognition should not be the first explored solution. It really should be this last resort, mostly because of the fact that it's the same thing as keeping track of someone's fingerprint again. It's a very sensitive, and as a result, even if you are collecting the faces of, for example, children so that you can build a data set of all the children in a particular region and identify the lost children in a crowd, that authority figure, if they wanted to, you know, that could be the use case of that facial recognition tool for 10 years, but it just takes, you know, one year of someone deciding, oh, actually, I want to use this to track this particular minority group or the children from this particular minority group. And they're able to do that now because that infrastructure is there. So because it's such sensitive information, I'm very wary of talking about positive use cases because I think all of these positive use cases kind of include the underbelly or the dark side of the fact that it requires the collection of this sensitive information. So even in these positive use cases, I still implore a lot of people to really reflect on if there are alternatives and really reflect on those alternatives. And in you know 99.999% of the cases, there's an alternative method of implementing that objective without collecting this very sensitive data. Absolutely. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of ongoing research in this area, a lot of stuff you and your collaborators and many others are focusing on. Tell me a little bit about this upcoming ICML project that you're involved in and uh, how this might move the conversation forward. Thank you for asking that. That was fun from a conversation around what does it actually take for us to build machine learning systems that we can trust to be created for our own benefit? And this is a really hard question, obviously, but one of the ideas explored with respect to this was uh, this vision coming out of the HCI space, the human computer interaction space around participatory design. So really the idea of participatory design is that of thinking about how do you get the affected population or the affected users to actually contribute to the design process of the system. And in the case of machine learning, or if we're talking about facial recognition, one of the considerations that we talk about with facial recognition is this idea of thinking about procedural fairness. So thinking about sometimes the labels of the model are unfair. (laughs) Sometimes the taxonomy of the data set is unfair. The objective of the system is unfair. If I take a picture of a room and I label very specific items, those are items that I as an engineer see as important or that are easiest for me to label as important, but not necessarily the items that are most important for the person affected by the system or the person using the system. So participatory ML is really this idea of, you know, what if there was a collective way for us to define the objectives of a machine learning system? How would we go about that? And if we were to think of some of these collective democratic methods of training a machine learning system, you know, what would that do with respect to how much we trust these systems? How would that affect our perception of the accuracy or the reliability of these systems to do something to our benefit? That was where that work came from. And that's where we're taking that work. And we're having a workshop on that at ICML. So I invite anyone that's interested joining on that conversation, because we're very much a brainstorming visioning session to imagine the future of what this looks like. Well, depending on timing and release dates, tell us the deadlines and how people could become participants if they're so inclined. Yeah. So to participate, (laughs) they can submit a four-page abstract to the participatory ML workshop. We have a website by June 22nd and to participate happening at the same time as ICML, so July 17th and 18th. So they have some time to sign up to participate as just observers and just discussion members. But if you have an idea that's connected to this concept of democratic, cooperative, or even there's a section of the participatory ML paradigm that we talk about audits and we talk about empowering communities by communicating to them the specifics of how these systems work. So if you're even working on audits, editing in general, and you're curious as to how to democratize our understanding of how these systems work, you're also very much welcome to submit something or to just come in and join in on the discussions. Sounds good. And maybe to wind up, there's an angle at which we could say some of this research is pessimistic, pointing out the fact that things have been used or can be weaponized and have been perhaps and things like that. Is there a silver lining here you can leave us with? Well, what if the reality is pessimistic? (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. I think the silver lining here, and this is something that I reflect on a lot because there's sort of two camps of, do we make this better or do we burn it all down? (laughs) How do we respond to this? Especially when we see a very disappointing audit results, right? Like in this paper, we talk about how people only improve for the tasks that they're audited on. So people get very discouraged and they're like, we can't audit for every single task or do we audit for every single task? How do you cover all the ground available? in order to build a system that actually is reliable in the way that you need it to be reliable. So I think that is a very discouraging result, especially given the wide disparities 
that we see with the, between subgroups of, you know, 30% disparities. But I guess the silver lining here is, one, this is evidence that we should not have these systems deployed. So everything that we audit in this paper and in past papers and in future papers are real systems, are systems that are already out there in the world, they're products that people are selling. And I think the silver lining for me is that by pointing out these discrepancies in performance, we have justification for pulling those products off the shelves, at least momentarily, as we saw with IBM, Amazon, and Microsoft. We're really helping people and preventing further harm by virtue of communicating a limitation of the system. So I think in that case, it does a lot of good. <laughs> we create an argument for pressing pause on systems that are too immature to be deployed in the real world. And I think ultimately that's a very good thing because it protects a lot of the people that are affected by it. A silver lining for the people creating these technologies, I think it's very, very good for them to understand the limitations of their systems. I think machine learning is very good at specific types of problems in very specific contexts and very specific conditions. And work like this really helps machine learning practitioners understand the context in which their technology is effective, but also understand the context in which it's not and better understand and communicate amongst themselves what the limits of the technology are. And I think that will lead to more intelligent deployments of the technology and more intelligent design of the technology. And I'm really excited to see that. I'm not saying this specifically for facial recognition, but I think machine learning more broadly if we're smarter about the way that we evaluate things, hopefully we'll get to a point where we really truly understand or have a good sense of what it means to deploy this system and how it'll operate in the real world. When you're a machine learning engineer, or when you're working on a machine learning engineering team, a common occurrence is you build your model on your computer and then you evaluate it on the test set that everybody uses. And then you get it, you know, 99% accuracy and you're excited. And then you throw it out into the real world. In the real world, it performs super poorly and you get a bunch of complaints. Now you Need to reassess the whole situation. And that happens so frequently as part of the engineering process and machine learning. Part of the blame there is the fact that our evaluations and our assessments are not necessarily reflective of the realities of the real world in multiple ways, right? So in the case of this facial recognition system, a lot of the benchmarks that we used for facial recognition for a very, very long time before this work came out did not include a lot of black faces. It didn't include a lot of darker skinned people. And because of that, when the systems were deployed in the real world, it didn't work for that population. So by virtue of improving the benchmarks that we have, but also engaging in some of these more nuanced conversations around privacy, around the weaponization of this technology, we can better assess and understand how these systems are expected to function within society, within the real world. And hopefully we can be a lot smarter about deployment. We can make a lot smarter decisions around, should we deploy this? How do we deploy this? What are the conditions required for us to deploy this? Which I think is just going to be a better situation for the machine learning community in general, right? Where hopefully we'll get to the point where we actually have assessments that we can rely on and we can kind of realistically communicate the functionality of some of these systems while we're working towards building things that truly function in the real world within society. Um, so yeah, that for me is uh, the silver lining. I'm excited to get to a world where when I'm assessing something on my engineering team, and then I'm assessing something in pilot, the performance is comparable and it's reliable and it makes sense to me. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. I think that's a vision that I, I hope to see fulfilled. And I'm appreciative to be able to follow researchers like you and your co-authors and others in the space who are looking into these problems. If others want to as well, where can they best follow you online? I'm mostly on Twitter these days. I don't think I have other options at Raji Inio. So R A J I. I and I O and I tweet a lot about AI evaluation and auditing and assessments and accountability in general. Well, I know we're going to follow you and I hope all the listeners do as well to keep their ear to the vine on the conversation that's going on. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic Interpretability. Our guest this week was Deborah Raji. Our associate producer is Claudia Armbruster. Our guest coordinator is Vanessa Bursiaga. I'm your host, Kyle Polich. Thanks for listening, and see you guys next week. Attention.